Hey everybody, welcome back to Juice's Arthropods. My name is Juice and I am taking a risk with this video. Today we're going to talk about vampire crabs. But Juice, why are you taking a risk? Well, because I don't know anything about anything aquatic and these are vampire crabs, which also means they're semi-aquatic. So the video today is going to be a little different than normal. And the reason is because I'm going to be talking about the entire genus, but I also understand that every single species is going to have uniqueness. So what I'm really going to do is I'm going to talk about the genus, but then I'm really going to be talking about the one species that I've actually, actually got to breed, how I've done it, and how another species is doing the same. So I figure if two species are doing good, I must be doing something right. Anyways, that's a long-winded way to say I'm going to be winging it here, so come along for the ride. So vampire crabs or genus Geosasarma, Geosasarma there we go, uh, these guys are called vampire crabs just because of their bright yellow eyes. And most of these species are just beautiful colors. They're from a whole array of different continents uh, in different places, but we're going to be kind of focusing a little bit more on the Geosasarma denaril today. Now, this creature is technically endangered, and for some reason, you can buy these for nothing online, which is a problem. So my goal as always, is to take creatures that are, for some reason, kind of skating past any laws of any kind and see if I can't help uh, breeding programs to also help with conservation at the end of the day. So I, the reason they're not for sale is because ultimately my goal is to partner with other people with these so that I can actually help them so that we don't have to worry or rely on the pet trade at the end of the day. So a lot of my tips are going to be around the denural species, uh, but Geosasarma in general should also probably apply to some of these because of every crustacean is relatively the same in that in that respect. So Geosasarma, we're just going to call them vampire crabs from now on. Um, they're very unique in that they they like some veggies, they like some fruits, they like some bugs, they like some rotten stuff, they like living. They basically will eat everything. They're omnivores. So what's really cool about these guys is that if you give them things like duckweed or live moss, you'll actually catch them eating it all the time. And if you are a fan of bioactive in the way that I am, you can set your tank up completely bioactive the same way I do and it's completely self-sustaining all I have is a bubble filter in there get all the uh the nutrients right get the pH right which is a whole different beast and, and look I need to make this abundantly clear with you I have no idea what I'm doing with pH or any of the acidity levels. What I did is I went there and I'm going to actually link the product below. I bought something that naturally just adds bacteria into the water. I let that bacteria run rampant in there. I added the crabs in. I made sure that I just cleaned up, um, you know, I added some water filtration things that basically takes away some of the chemicals from tap water. And then I let this thing run on its own. I put wood in there. I put duckweed, which is growing uncontrollably, which you'll see in a second. I put live moss and I put some, I accidentally put snails in there. And so ultimately what you're going to see is just a slew of muck that's in there. But here's the thing. That disgusting looking muck is a vampire crabs just, mm, that's their breeding ground. That is where they go to get hot and heavy with the ladies. So as disgusting as this thing looks, it actually worked out very well because it has all of the things they need. Consistent food supply, a bioactive, I even have some isopods in there and snails so they get different kinds of protein. I toss some occasional um, either mouse pellets or koi pellets or some sort of protein fish food in there. And then I just make sure that as the water levels drop, I add some water back in, add the stuff that takes the chemicals out of the water, and it runs itself at the end of the day. So, but in terms of diet, just throw them whatever you want to. They'll be totally fine, but highly recommend you set this up bioactive. Let's talk about care. So when I first got these guys, I was very nervous because as I'm sure if you're watching this, you've seen, there's not a lot of information out there on how to properly take care of them. Or rather there is, but if you know anything about fish and aquatic people, they are lunatics about making sure that the pH is perfect and all these other factors are perfect. When I was doing it, I tried very desperately to do all that, 
but I'm just not good at it. So what I found that works best is leave it alone. Just let it, if it's 70 plus degrees in your house, the water might feel cold to you. It's not going to feel cold to them. It'll be totally fine. The water temperature just needs to stay above 68 degrees. And I promise you, if it's 72 or 73 in your house, the temperature is probably in the 70s. You just don't realize it because when you go in the nice warm bathtub, it's 125 plus degrees. As long as your water temperatures are in the 70s or even the high 60s, these guys will be fine. They don't live in the water. They live on land. You just need the water if you want them to breed and also they go in the water when they're molting so they'll be totally okay if the water gets down to 67 68 degrees they'll be fine what's really important though is that it's oxygenated so you definitely want to get yourself a bubble filter it keeps a lot of the beneficial bacteria within the water so that you can have that natural bioactive enclosure type setup now the, the only thing that's really important when you're thinking about care for these guys is are you trying to breed them and how many are you trying to get? If you're not trying to breed them, then just get females. You don't need to add males at all because the males will actually try to kill each other um, as long as there's enough space. So you need on average, they'll say a five gallon tank for two females, one male. I say that's too, too small. You need at minimum a 10 gallon tank for one male and two females. If you plan on adding more than that, you need to continuously adding onto the gallons, man, because at the end of the day, those males, a, a five gallon tank is just too close. Those males, once there are breeding females capable, they will kill each other. So my recommendation, get all females if you don't plan on breeding or get a 10 gallon tank with one male, two females, if you're going to do the uh, that route. Humidity is funny. Um, just missed them every couple so often. So what I do is I have a, a top on top of my tank and then I do miss down the moss that's under there. I have some lights to create an artificial day and light uh, night. They are obviously, as their name implies, uh, they are nocturnal. So you really won't see these. I actually think they might be corpuscular, but at the end of the day, I almost never see these guys in the daytime. I only see them at nighttime or first thing in the morning when I turn the lights on. Uh, what they're going to do is you need to create a habitat that essentially allows them for tunneling and they'll make their own little caverns. And essentially how I did this, and I'll show you the right way to do it, and then I'll show you the wrong way to do it. I tried two different methods, and I do not like the one method. Um, you want to just take something like uh, people with like when they're making reptile tanks, you want that foam, the foaming spray that people have. You want to spray that and kind of create a 45 degree angle upwards. And then you want that bottom, I would say, um, you know, probably the first three or four inches of it to be water everything above needs to be soil and they need to be allowed to dig in there at the end of the day so but when it comes to humidity the reason i'm mentioning all that is because you need to make sure that you have something that has that arc and gradient and then the humidity will just be naturally pulling in from the actual water that's down there so you don't need to worry about humidity too much because they can breathe it so just letting you know in terms of longevity these guys only live about two years maximum um they're not a very long-lived species what's cool though is we'll talk more about fecundity is that um if you have males and females you can have a pretty consistent amount of these guys they are really cool i will say we'll talk more about it in the cons um my only beef with these guys in general, because they have such short longevity, is as cool as they are, they don't live that long, which means you kind of almost are required to breed them. So because also they're endangered and you don't want to just keep purchasing these. So that would be my only con um, or my only problem with their longevity is just the fact that like you need to either breed them or you need to not buy them ever again once you have them die. Let's talk about fecundity. I know I've kind of alluded to it a second ago. They have a lot of babies. They will, because you're creating essentially a gradient arc, you need to have a minimum two to three inches. Basically, you want three times their height. Um, I would say even go six or seven times their height. You need to have six or seven times the height of water so that when they go under there, they can molt like every other arthropod does. Um, and But what they'll do is they will essentially take their little crabbiness They'll do their pairing, which I have no idea how they breed. They just happen to do it, and I've never been privy to watching it. They do it at late at night. I have seen them kind of walk up. 
they do like a little howdy doody and then they kind of like after a while part ways i don't uh, i don't know i i'll make another video once i watch them doing it um but ultimately what they do is they will lay their eggs by the water's edge so they they'll lay them in the water think of like kind of like how toads and or uh, frogs rather and tadpoles they'll kind of like lay them along the water's edge and you're gonna see some like weirdness where you're like what is this snotty mess that's there that is them that's them laying their eggs so then one day you're gonna be like oh all the babies must be dead and then you're gonna realize that no they're just freaking microscopic the babies even like they are basically smaller than a grain of sand well they're probably about the size of a grain of sand maybe a size of a grain of rice they are a very 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 tiny baby like i have seen isopod babies bigger than these things and then all of a sudden they're everywhere like the dirt is moving it, it's crazy so what's really important and why i'm telling you this is because it's very crucial if you do have babies you get like blood worms or some of those worms that you can add to fish tanks because you want them something to hunt but an isopod might be too too big of a meal for them at the end of the day. So give them some of those. And that's where having lots of different, you know, snails and, and isopods and springtails and all of that is going to be extremely beneficial. Now, one thing to note about fecundity, they will eat their babies. <laughs> they have no problems against cannibalism or matricide. So you just need to make sure that if you do have babies, that you separate the babies eventually, or they will become a very tasty snack. Let's talk about pros. The pros are, these guys are awesome. Crabs are so cool. And, and I really feel like they're an underrepresented uh, like group in the community of arthropods. You know, everybody talks about like, mm, can you add butter to those? Yes, you can. If you want no meat of any kind, you sadistic bastard. Don't eat these. They're endangered, you fool. But anyways... Everybody always wants to have different levels of arthropods. They want tarantulas. They want this. They want that. But they forget the crabs are also an arthropod. They're just sea bugs, guys. So at the end of the day, I think that's dope that we can own these things. And I wish more people did. The problem is most arthropod people such as myself are really bad when it comes to fish tanks. I don't even know what I'm doing. I couldn't even make this video as good as I wanted it to be because like everything I've done has been a process of failure or success and once it was succeeding and i continuously was able to produce those results i was like cool i'll make this video the problem is how do i explain it i put crabs in a tank and they bred <laughs> done <laughs> that's all i know how to do what variables changed I literally just made it bioactive. When I put too much control into it, when I added too much into the process, I was unsuccessful. So my best advice for these guys is don't overthink it. Keep it simple, stupid. That's the best advice I have for these. Pro number two, the coloration. You know, I mentioned the Geosasarma de Neural, but there are like Carnival. There is a million different kinds of these guys that make them almost like you can have your own starter Pokemon. What variation do you want at the end of the day? I particularly picked the uh, ghost orchids. They are a very beautiful looking. They have white legs. It's awesome. But you know what? That was just because they were literally Juice's Arthropods coloration. I had to take that. They're so cool. Pro number three, at the end of the day, these guys, once you set up the tank and you stop overthinking it, it is a very, very easy species to keep alive at the end of the day. Let's talk about the cons. To set this tank up, it requires you to, one, buy the stuff. And what I mean is you have to buy a 10-gallon tank. You have to buy a bubble filter. You have to buy that foam that's specifically for outdoor ponds so that you can spray it so that it has a 45-degree incline that you can then put real soil on top of and some sand to make an artificial bank. Then you have to add things such as sticks, rotten everything, and then moss, and then you got to add isopods and springtails, add the bubble filter in, add the water, add the chemicals to the water, add the, the actual bioactive uh, organisms that make it to where the water won't just become stagnant, and then you got to connect that to a filter. And there are whisper filters, by the way, that I will link below that will 
literally save your sanity. Because what you probably were thinking of doing is going buying a regular filter, but you can't do that. And you know why you can't do that? Because when you do that, the normal filters are used to fish being all the way at the top of the tank and it just circulates water that way. But nope, you can't have more than two or three, maybe four inches of water in this. So you have to rig the entire setup or you can buy a bubble filter and you can just shut up and trust me that it will save you dozens of hours of agony of your filter constantly getting little isopods or snails getting sucked up in there and then maybe you'll at some point think like hey wouldn't it be cool if i added some shrimp to this and that's cool neocardinia awesome shrimp but then you have a different problem they need a totally different care so don't don't do it unless you have a lot of time and a lot of patience and you don't plan on breeding both of these things because one of them will eat the other one and it is a nightmare so what is the biggest con do you hear all of this is this not making you already bored of watching this video because that's what the last six months has been like for me of a constant going crazy over making this perfect and that mind-numbing hum of a normal fish tank filter is maddening. So, con number one. Con number two, these guys are endangered, guys, and, like, they're exclusively wild-caught, and it sucks, sucks to have to buy that. So buy them from people that are either doing captive bread or decide to breed them. Do not buy them if you're not breeding them just don't and and like everyone wants them and everybody sees it and like petco had them and and that's so cool and good for them and i'm glad but at the end of the day we need to stop buying endangered species stop buying hermit crabs also while you're at it because those are also exclusively wild caught so that's con number two and con number three if you are like me and you have a lot of different arthropods having one that has drastically different care from everything else you have is kind of a strain on your life. And that all of the rest of these takes me six to seven hours to feed everything. But you know what it doesn't do? It doesn't prepare you for any of the care required for vampire crabs. So are they a good pet? Yeah. Are they a lose your mind pet until you set it up? Yes. Or you can just listen to juice and keep it freaking simple. Thank you again, Arthur people. And remember, stay safe, stay educated, and most of all, stay classy.